Hello, my name is Mike Lodes, and today I'm going to be taking a look at how medieval weapons and armour are portrayed in video games. The video games I'm going to take a look at today are Kingdom Come, The Witcher, For Honour, Mordal, Chivalry, Dark Souls and Mountain Blade. Let's take a look at how swords are used in video games. Forging a sword. Kingdom Come Deliverance. Do it. So what we see in this clip is the finishing stages. The blade has already been made. But what I like about this clip is these people clearly are taking care. You know what you're doing. High status swords, they were made by alchemy. It, it's an incredibly sophisticated process. Give it here and we'll put it all together. Where it goes slightly wrong is where he's putting the grip on at the end. Although it's true that you would heat the tang, that's the little bit that comes up from the blade for, for the grip to go on. What they're doing there is they've heated half the blade. All that art, all that care to get the proper spring temper will have been lost. Because they, they've heated it up and, and thrown it away. And the other little technical problem is when they put the pommel on, that's the, the bit that balances a sword at the end. When they put that on, they, they just plop it on. Well, the, the, the tang, that should come through the pommel, so there's a little bit sticking up. And then you hammer that over and splay it out, peen it out, rivet it out, and that's what holds everything secure and together. This pommel would have fallen off as soon as they picked it up. So little details are wrong, but the feel of the thing is great. It's magnificent. One-handed versus two-handed use of the sword. Dark Souls. If you tap Y when you're in a situation like this, when you have a one-handed sword and a shield, you switch to two-handed. But blocking with the sword doesn't really block. They kind of completely misunderstand <laughs> how swords are used. It doesn't block 100% of the damage. That's just wrong. Putting two hands on will give you a more powerful stroke. It does not in any way hinder your ability to defend with a sword. When you're using a single-handed, an arming sword with one hand, then, then clearly you're always going to favour your dominant arm because mostly that's going to be the stronger arm. Pens, I know, but the, the mightier than the sword. You don't ever block with a sword. That's not how it's done. I'm using the flat, I knock it aside. I'm keeping a flow. So this idea of, of square blocking it may be easier for game developers to create that kind of action, but it's not how it was done. Single-edged swords versus double-edged swords for honour. Well, you know, the first thing I've got to say about that clip is how good I thought the action was. I mean, the armour was distracting because it's so fantastically wrong. But the body shapes, the movements, the positions they got in. That was good. It had quality there. The advantage of a two-edged sword is if one edge is getting a little dull, you can turn it around and you've got a second edge to use. So it can be a considerable advantage on the battlefield that you're keeping one edge sharp. The advantage of a single-edged sword is usually that it's less expensive because you don't have to have such a sophisticated temper. That is authentic. As long as you're gripping tight enough, the sword won't move. And if it doesn't move, it won't cut you. So this person is not able to pull it through this person's hand because this person has taken it and they've turned it into a lever action, removing the sword from their hand. So those kind of blade-grabbing disarms are authentic 
and they are possible, but they require skill and knowledge and do not try this at home. Throwing a sword, Mordhau. Swords are extremely versatile weapons. That's one of their advantages. You can use them in all sorts of different ways. A powerful man with a powerful thrust, delivering a thrust to somebody's chest could almost stop a heart. You can use it as a lever to unbalance your opponent. You've got that great heavy pommel, that great metal weight on the end, and you can have deflected the sword and use the pommel to smash and punch. Why? Why would you throw it? It is so stupid to throw away a weapon. And it's not even that the person has lots of other weapons. I just can't get my head around the idea of somebody throwing a sword. Decapitation, Chivalry 2. So what we see here is clearly supposed to be a European medieval battlefield. And so in that context, you wouldn't see heads cut off in this way. Not least of all, because they're wearing armor. For Malric! Could a sword do it? Yeah, you could do it if you were fighting an army of naked people. You know, the neck is one of the first areas to get protective equipment. Even if you've got nothing else, you'd have a male collar or coif of some sort. One of the ways in which armour defends you is by creating curved surfaces, glancing surfaces. And of course, a body is always moving as well. So you can never land a pure 90 degree strike. You need enough edge just to bite in order to send that energy through. And I don't believe heads fly like that. Decorated swords for honor. It hungers for blood. Obviously the first thing to say about decoration, it was only ever available to the wealthy, uh, to princes and kings. But it was also much, much more restrained than we see here. It's called a flamboyant blade because it, it looks like flames. What these sharp, wavy edges do is constantly present a curved surface to the hand, so it is impossible to grab it without cutting your hand open, even if you were wearing a leather glove. Occasionally, you will find one that has got some gilding on the cross guard or on the pommel, but you really need to leave the blade as plain as possible because you don't want to compromise the integrity of the blade. You don't want to chisel into it so that you can put a gold inlay. You don't want to uh, scroll and etch and pierce and punch or do anything to it. That blade needs to perform to save your life. Leave it alone. Wearing a sword on your back, The Witcher 3. So here we see a really familiar trope, which is that the sword being carried on the back in a European medieval setting. It did not happen. The type of sword they're using here looks similar to what we would call a medieval long sword, which is a sword that you use with two hands, would stand about that height. You just can't actually get it out, a sword of that length, over the shoulder. Swords are worn in scabbards at the hip, and outside swords, very, very, very long swords, are carried over the shoulder. It's just that simple. Parries for honor. So for this one, we actually push as much as we can to cover the, all the uh, parts. It all starts by getting the armor wrong. By trying to give a sense of, of bulk and therefore presumably menace, they're amplifying the size of the armor. Look at those shoulders! And making these creatures into these great sort of automatons who, who move in a very awkward and, and, and lumbering way. <laughs> This idea of wide swings and opening yourself up and then, you know, 15 minutes later landing the blow, it has nothing to do with reality. The art of sword fighting is constantly keeping yourself covered. They weren't 
lumbering slow fools. They were martial artists, athletes, lightning fast reflexes, who had a system, a fighting style that was immensely sophisticated. Next, let's take a look at axes. Throwing an axe, Mordhau. <laughs> What we see here is two types of axe. A larger axe that he's using with two hands. He takes out a smaller axe, which he uses to throw. Looking at the armour and the clothing, it looks to be more kind of late medieval. Uh, and both of those axes shown are from a much, much, much earlier medieval period, from the, the sort of Frankish, Saxon, Viking period. The axes of the later medieval period, what are known as battle axes, were predominantly a horseman's weapon. They're not for throwing. The poleaxe, for honor. They carry the most versatile weapon ever invented. The poleaxe. First, the narrator is calling it a poleaxe instead of a poleaxe. There were such things as pole arms and a whole family of weapons that are, that are on long poles. But the poleaxe, P-O-L-L, -L, axe, is what knights called this slightly shorter pole arm. The poleaxe was between sort of four and, and five foot in height. Not, not, not a super long pole arm. It, it, it's very much a weapon that knights, when they were fighting on foot, this was their favorite weapon. It was substantial. And at the top end, it had an axe head and a hammer head. You know, this was a great chunk of metal, so that could land a fearsome blow. On top of that was a spike. And most importantly, at the bottom was this steel spike. A secret of their order. The beak. And it was that end that you did most of your fighting with. And when they arrive, pray that you... One of the great advantages of the poleaxe is it has reach and you can really work at close distance, at long distance. And when you get in there, you can use that shaft as a lever. They're doing it here, and that is right. That is straight out of the manuals that you get that in there, you get it behind their legs. It's the right spirit of the thing. Let's see how bows and arrows are portrayed in video games. The crossbow, mount and blade. One of the cunning things about this clip is they don't show you how the crossbow is being loaded. So we have this really rather unrealistic rate of shooting. There was a thing called a belt and claw where, where a claw hung from a belt and you went down and hooked that under the thing and you had your, your foot in the thing and you used your whole back to strain and your legs and your thighs were straining to pull that string back and, and hook it behind the trigger. It certainly couldn't be done as quickly as in this clip. Loading and aiming. Chivalry. There are two stages to preparing a longbow to shoot. The first one is what we call knocking. And that's the, you know, the little notch at the end of the arrow and getting that fitted to the string. In this clip, the speed of getting the arrow onto the string was credible. That, that, I can shoot that fast, maybe even a little faster. What takes longer is the second stage, the drawing back. You're drawing a longbow from your feet to your neck. Every muscle is engaged in pulling that string back and you pull it back here behind the ear. A longbow is a powerful weapon. 180 pounds, maybe even 200 pounds draw weight. The amount it takes to pull that string back. This is a massive athletic endeavor that has to be repeated over and over again so there are questions of stamina although we don't see very much of him we can see part of his archer's equipment which is a leather bracer on the inside of his left forearm and what it's for is it's for string slap 
As the string comes through, it just can catch that arm. Just get a snap. Now, if you've got a 150, 180, 200 pound longbow, I can assure you that string slap, you never want to pull that bow back again. Flaming arrows, chivalry two. So it looks great, doesn't it? We see these incendiary arrows like lightning strikes streaming across the sky. My experience with flaming arrows is they don't stay alight in the sky looking quite so wonderful as that. But they do work and they did exist. Does it have any practical military function and is it real? Well, you certainly wouldn't use them in an open battlefield like that uh, because it's pointless. What are you going to do? Set individual people alight as a bonus because you've already killed them with your arrow? You would use them in sieges and in terror raids. Fire has always been a dreadful, awful terror weapon. Let's look at some other medieval weapons that are popular in video games. Spears, Mordhau. The advantage of a spear is its reach. Uh, if you've got cavalry coming towards you, you can extend and you know you can go for the horse. The disadvantage of a spear is its reach. There's that much of weapon on the end of a stick. Once you've extended and, and thrust that, if the person gets inside that point, it's easy to either cleave your thin wooden shaft with, with their sword or their axe, or to get hold of that spear and wrench it out of your hand. Once he's inside the point, the spear's useless. Mace, chivalry. Maces, as a general blunt force weapon, were widespread on the medieval battlefield. No, my lord. What we see here, when they call it a mace, it's more like a morning star, which is a kind of a two-handed mace with spikes on, which came in a little bit later. Something that all armor had in common is it deflected blows. It gave a skidding surface. It's very difficult to get that energy into the man underneath unless you can get a, a microsecond of bite. So that's really what the spikes were for. They look really grisly and play into our idea of medieval brutality. But all they're for is for grabbing hold of the target in order to deliver the energy through the armor. Flail for honor. Their flail is as dangerous to the wielder as it is to the enemy. I mean, the idea is it's the same as a mace. It's a blunt force trauma weapon. But its disadvantage is having struck, the chain goes limp and comes down. You have to prepare it with relatively wide strokes. We really have no strong evidence that it was ever a real thing. We do have evidence, however, that it was thought of. Throughout the medieval period, military engineers and artists and designers produced military manuals. Sometimes, however, you find a diamond in the rough. Leonardo da Vinci was one of a long line of designers of, of military machines. A lot of the machines and ideas in here n never happened. Daggers, dark souls. The dagger uses very little stamina. So you can attack many times over before depleting your stamina, even if you have low endurance. So daggers were pretty much a universal weapon on the, on the medieval battlefield. Everybody carried a dagger. Clearly a weapon of last resort. It's a weapon of close hand-to-hand -hand fighting. What I found extraordinary on this clip is, is, is where the narration said, Do note that the range is short. I just wanted to shout in his ear, well, let go of one hand and you'll double your reach. Because obviously you've got limited reach if you're working like that. But, I've, you know, I've now got double the extension. It's about how you use what you have. It's a one-handed weapon. It's not a two-handed weapon. Now we're going to talk about tactics. Taking over a village. Kingdom come. Deliverance. <laughs> This clip had the, the, the element of surprise and, you know, for any attack on a village to be successful, it needs an element of surprise. Of course, 
if you're attacking with an army of that size, there's not going to be any surprise. You would hear them from miles away. You would see the clouds of dust from miles away. So raiding parties would be small. You wouldn't need more than 20, 30 men to raid a village like that. They'd use incendiary arrows. They would gallop through with flaming torches and drop them in the buildings. You don't need a big army to attack a small village. You do need surprise. Firebomb weapons for honor. Did we get 12 of these bombs? Like, that's, uh, that's pretty excessive. A different raider. They had clay pots which they filled with what was really Greek fire, which was a secret recipe developed in 670 or so by a man named Kalinikos. And this was an incredible flammable substance that, that just kept on burning. It could even burn on water. Here, take that, sir. But running around the battlefield with a flammable pot is a pretty dangerous business. It's not like pulling the pin on a grenade where you know exactly the moment you're going to throw it. They really need to be deployed from a fixed position and best used in a ranged weapon like a Fustiball or with a great siege engine like a trebuchet. Circle formation. Mountain Blade, Bannerlord. <laughs> In a certain cavalry situations, a circle formation is exactly what you need, especially if you're outnumbered. The Scots called it the Chiltern. In fact, they pioneered that technique. Not so much, I would suggest, against uh, an artillery attack with an arrow storm. The bowmen only have to range slightly differently, and they've got the backs of the people undefended with their shields at, at, at the other side of the circle. <laughs> but it's like, come and get me, shoot me in the back. I wouldn't choose a circle that size because there's so much room in the middle. You could, you could get quite a lot of horsemen smashing through the line of two that you've got there and they could wreak havoc round the backs of, of the other troops. <laughs> Don't periodically keep breaking your formation, otherwise there's no point in having it. Fighting on horseback. Mount and blade. Bannerlord. Cavalry can be used in two main ways. You have heavy cavalry smashing into a mass of troops for the impact charge, and you have light cavalry with swords or bows or even light lances skirmishing or raiding or, or, or just harrying troops on the battlefield. Here we're seeing versatile light cavalry skirmishing. The weapon of first strike for the horseman is the lance. The long lance over your back. That's the cavalry charge. But it's a one strike weapon. It's one kebab each and you're done. Its greatest benefit is not just the speed of delivering attacks, it's the ability to pull back and come again. It's that ability on a horse that you couldn't even begin to match with a man on foot. You know, the stamina of a horse to do those repeated attacks, that's really where it gives you the edge. Let's look at defensive weapons. Shield shapes, Mordhau. Today I wanted to talk about shields in Mordhau. The earliest type shown in, in this clip is the kite shield. You can easily block pretty much anything in front of you. A sort of Norman style shield from the sort of 11th century. By the 12th century it had already gone out. So it, it has a very limited time period to a very specific culture. The kite shield is a much larger shield that pretty much envelops the entire body from head to your shins. Gradually that shield gets shorter and more compact as armor for the lower leg gets better and you end up with what's called the heater shield. Very good for protecting the upper torso, especially when you're on horseback. And you need 
that extra layer of protection to withstand the extraordinary force of being struck with a lance by a man on horseback. Moving on to the parry shields, we have the targe and the buckler. The targe, a round shield. This one is specifically a kind of Scots weapon. It's, it's smaller than the Viking round shield. It had, you know, more maneuverability. Rather than just blocking with your weapon, you simply block with your shield. The Highland Scots were famous for their charge, running in their kilts across the heather. You don't want something clumsy, you want something light. But they're facing arrows. That's what shields are for. They're for facing arrow storms. The buckler and the targe have very minor differences between them, but function exactly the same. In terms of size, they have the exact same block radius. The type of shield that is used almost exclusively for hand-to-hand -hand fighting is the buckler. This was a specialist little shield, a little round shield completely faced with steel. A little steel fist. You use it like a fist. You punch the enemy's weapons away. A sword's coming in here, you punch it away. Very skillful, but very fast flowing way of fighting. The final shield in Mordhau is the pavice. The pavice. Complete polar opposite of the buckler. The pavice is a static shield. It just sits there. It can be placed down pretty much anywhere on a flat surface or even rough terrain. It's what crossbowmen carried on their backs, set up on the battlefield, because they had to shelter behind something to work the claw mechanism of loading their bows. It was a, a question of different shields for different fields, but they all had a different purpose. Armour. Mordhau. The most important thing about armour is that it gives you as much protection as possible. The second most important thing about armour is that it allows you to fight as well as possible. What I love about this clip is that it starts with a knight running whilst wearing armour. That is a reality. A knight would be able to run, to sprint in armour. Boussicot, one of the generals of the French army at Agincourt, he was known to go for a mile run in his armour every morning. The drop kick is probably a little bit fantastical, but armour was designed for the fighting man. The way we see a sword slicing through armour, that, that's just plain fantasy. It's fine as fantasy, but it's certainly not a reality. So there's a lot of different types of armour. Plate armour, the type we're seeing here, a second skin of metal, an exoskeleton of metal where the knight became a walking work of art. And it was tailored to precision so that every joint articulated. The most vulnerable points are those articulation points. So if you're raising your sword to strike, then that is more vulnerable than the bit covered with a plate. But they had things called bezidues, which, which are little metal discs. They had solutions to these problems. So there is this constant trade-off between weight, articulation, and protection. That has been extremely interesting to me as a dull old historian to look at how these weapons are represented in video games. What's exciting about video games today is it's, it's often the first hook, the first lure to get young minds interested in history and history is exciting and we mustn't lose the excitement just because of a few details that might not be right. <laughs>